We're on a mission. We invite you to dream, to pray, to discern, to envisage what it is that God is calling you to do and be for his kingdom. What's the vision of our future that beckons or draws us forward? For every single one of us, every day of the week, whatever we find ourselves doing, we are open for business as servants of the Lord. Hi, and welcome to Central Baptist Virtual Church. For the foreseeable future, we'll be producing a downloadable video like this one that helps us be in community even if we can't meet together. We want to keep our usual teaching diet from the Word of God happening. We want to tell stories of what's happening in the life of our church and to love one another. Now, the COVID-19 virus may well have stopped us gathering in one place, but the Spirit of God across His church is as active as ever. Let's make this an exciting time. I mean, to borrow a phrase that Joseph, way back in the Old Testament, used, what the devil intended for harm, God intended for good to accomplish what has now been done, the saving of many lives. Enjoy. In his book, The Irresistible Revolution, Living as an Ordinary Radical, Shane Claiborne writes about an event that he was speaking at. He said, I I asked participants who claimed to be strong followers of Jesus whether Jesus spent time with the poor. Nearly 80% said yes. Uh, And then later on in the survey, I sneaked in another question. I asked the same group of strong followers whether they spent time with the poor and less than 2% said they did. He said, I learned a powerful lesson. We can admire and worship Jesus without doing what he did. We can applaud what he preached and stood for without caring about the same things ourselves. We can adore his cross without taking up ours, and I had come to see that the great tragedy of the church is not that rich Christians do not care about the poor, but that rich Christians do not know the poor. Well, the topic that we're looking at today is our response towards those who are poor. Uh, over recent weeks, we've been reminding ourselves of why we exist as a church and we've, why we do what we do. We've looked at our, our mission statement, for instance, our reason for being, uh, to prepare God's people for works of service. Uh, We've looked at the first five of seven core values that we hold dear as a church. Uh, Authentic community, uh, relationship with God, biblical authority, evangelism. Last Sunday it was volunteerism. And today we're up to value number six, priority of the poor. As a Christian church, We're committed to following the teaching and the example of Jesus and, well, doing the kind of things that he did and would do if he was in our circumstance. And one of the most unmistakable attributes of Jesus was a particular compassion and priority towards people who were poor and vulnerable. Now, to be sure, Jesus didn't only hang out with poor people or those who were sick. He did also grace the homes uh, and the gatherings of the wealthy as well. But any serious student of the life and times of Jesus would have to agree that the poor and vulnerable of his day received a particular focus or priority attention. Well, if that was Jesus' modus operandi, well, surely we who follow him need to do the same thing. In Luke chapter 16, verse 13, uh, Jesus made a rather radical statement about money that people of his day would have found quite uncomfortable. Uh, He said this, he said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
But well, the very next verse goes on to tell how a group of religious leaders, Pharisees who loved money and what it could buy, sneered at Jesus over the statement. In fact, the actual Greek word meant more than a mere smirk. It actually meant that they laughed out loud and absolutely rubbished what he was saying, suggesting that there was a relationship between material wealth and spiritual wealth. <laughs> And it was probably in response to this cynicism and sneering on the, the part of religious leaders in his day, Jesus told the following story. That there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and lying to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Well, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and, and you is a great chasm that has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Well, Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, when it comes to parables, there are some special interpretation rules that we really need to keep in mind. Uh, for instance, we don't interpret every character or every event literally. A parable is a, a story that generally illustrates just one point. It's not a description of actual events that took place. I mean, the Lazarus in this parable, for instance, is not the Lazarus in John 11 who died and was raised from the grave by Jesus. Uh, the name Lazarus meant literally, God is my help. It was probably a very common name. But what's interesting to note here, though, is that this is the only parable that Jesus ever told where he gave a name to one of the characters. Well, maybe that's significant. It's important, too, that we don't interpret the events of this parable as a description of what happens after we die. I mean, some people have tried to see in this parable a glimpse of the afterlife, as if those in, in hell or Hades can see those who are in paradise uh, across a great chasm, or that hell is literally a great fire. Jesus didn't tell this parable to illuminate the nature of heaven or hell. He told this parable to illustrate a connection between wealth and compassion for the poor. So if, if parables primarily impart one central idea, how ought we to understand this one? Well, one way to look at this parable is to imagine that it's a play, that there are two primary characters and there are two scenes. In fact, it's a little bit like a spiritual version of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, except in this case, Ebenezer Scrooge uh, doesn't actually wake up. So in, in scene one, the first character is a man who is wealthy beyond our wildest dreams. Jesus said he was dressed in purple cloth and fine linen. Now, that may not mean that much to us in our context, but in the context of Jesus' day, that was actually designer apparel. Only the rich could afford those kinds of clothes, clothes that were worth, well, let's say hundreds of dollars a piece uh, in an economy where the average man's working wage was only a few cents a day. So, so Jesus was actually employing a little bit of satire here. 
I mean, the Pharisees who so often gave him a hard time, they were renowned for wearing fine clothes and purple cloth too. And people, I'm sure, listening would have actually got the subtle connection with that Jesus had to say who he's talking about. But, but this wealthy man didn't just dress high. In fact, verse 19 says that he lived in opulent luxury every day. Uh, in an age where the average family might eat meat once a week, he ate steak or roast every single meal. Enter the second character in the story, a poor man named Lazarus, a beggar, probably scantily clad and so sick or crippled he couldn't work. Uh, while the rich man lived and, and dined in uh, luxurious comfort, poor old Lazarus lay out at his gate, not having the strength to even ward off dogs that came and licked his open sores. But while the rich man dined in gastronomical delight, poor Lazarus would have loved to have had even crumbs that fell from his table. Uh, in those days, of course, there's no such thing as, as knives and forks and napkins like we might have today. Food was eaten with your bare hands. And in very wealthy houses, the hands of dinner guests were sometimes cleaned of grease or sloppy food by wiping them on hunks of bread that were then thrown out in the garbage. Lazarus longed even for those crumbs or hunks of bread that fell from the rich man's table. Well, then the curtain closes on scene one. In scene two, both Lazarus and the rich man have died. However, they find themselves in very different places. Lazarus finds himself resting on the side of Abraham, living in paradise. The rich man finds himself roasting in Hades, living in eternal torment and punishment. Now, again, let, let, me, let me stress, Jesus was not illustrating here the nature of heaven and hell. He was illustrating the judgment and the justice of God on those two men. Each of them received an eternal reward for the way they lived their lives. Lazarus received or inherited paradise. Uh, which was in line with uh, another uncomfortable comment that Jesus made in Luke chapter twenty, uh, 6, verse 20, when he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. The, the rich man, by contrast, he inherited to his, for his lifestyle eternal torment. So the, the important question to ask of this parable is, well, what was the rich man's crime? What, what, what did he do so terribly wrong that he earned the reward that he got? I mean, for instance, surely Jesus wasn't saying that it was a sin to be wealthy, as if because a man has uh, lots of money and is rich, he gets to spend eternity in hell and the poor guy gets the reward of heaven. There's also no inference in the parable that the rich man was particularly cruel towards poor Lazarus. We don't read that he ordered him removed from his gateway or that he despised him or, or kicked him as he walked past. There's no suggestion that the man, uh, the rich man minded the crumbs and the food scraps even being thrown out to poor Lazarus. So, so why was the rich man in torment? Well, I guess the, the answer to a question like that is, is open to conjecture, but I, I want to give you my understanding on the basis of the context in which Jesus was speaking. Now, remember, he's just been sneered at by a group of uh, religious leaders because he made this suggestion that you cannot serve both God and money. Now, I, I don't believe the rich man in Jesus' story ended up in hell so much for what he did as what he didn't do. So the rich man wasn't punished for acts of cruelty towards Lazarus per se, but rather for a lifestyle of ignoring him. And the implication is that the rich man basically carried on living in sumptuous and exorbitant luxury uh, 
oblivious to the desperate physical needs of the poor man that laid at his very gate. He never really noticed Lazarus, as if he just accepted him as part of the landscape, a body to be stepped over and ignored rather than someone to stop and tend. And because of that, that nonchalant, apathetic, uncaring, ignoring attitude of life towards the poor while he lived in opulent luxury, this rich man encountered the wrath and the judgment of God. Now, the, the point that I think Jesus was making is that if you love God and if you claim to live in a, a, a righteous relationship with him, you will not hoard or enjoy all your wealth exclusively to yourself. That, that's exactly what the Pharisees, the other religious leaders in Jesus' day were doing. They, they, they lived in luxury and splendor and they, they viewed their lifestyle as somehow God's blessing upon them. Toward the poor and the destitute, they really had no tangible compassion. Now, if we are truly followers of God, Jesus was saying, we would have an interest in the welfare of the poor. If we're truly righteous, we'll be active and motivated in fighting for and defending the concerns of the fatherless and the, the widows and the, the elderly and the homeless. If we're disciples of Jesus, we, we cannot ignore poverty in our world. Why? Because God can't. And God doesn't. And when we read the whole counsel of God's word, we, we find that there's actually a distinct bias in his response toward those who are poor. That's not to say that God loves poor people more than rich people, but, but there is a distinct theme that weaves its way throughout the scriptures. I mean, right back from the, the earliest teachings of Moses, we, we read these words from Deuteronomy 15 verses 7 and 8. If anyone is poor among you, your people, in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Or when you turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 31, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Proverbs 19, verse 17, those who are kind to the poor lend to the Lord and he will reward them for what they have done. Proverbs 22, verse 9, the generous will themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. Coming into the New Testament in Galatians chapter 2, we read there about the Apostle Paul and how he came to faith and was commissioned by the other apostles to be a missionary to the Gentiles. Here's how he describes it in verses 9 and 10 of Galatians 2. He said, James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me, that they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So, so certainly the, the earliest Christians took all of this very seriously. The leader of the first Christian church in Jerusalem around the middle of the first century was James, of course, the younger brother of Jesus. And when he wrote about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, he had some very strong words to say about the idea of being generous. James chapter 1 verse 27, he said, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. In other words, genuine relationship with God seems to be a whole lot less about words we say to God or words that we even read in the Bible as much as something evidenced by how we care for people in need. A little bit further on in that same letter, he went even further in James chapter 2, 
verses 14 and 17. He said, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if people claim to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical need, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, followers of Jesus are committed to the poor, to giving to them to praying for them, to going to them, to sharing with them. Uh, The rich man in the parable refused to notice them, and his end was judgment and torment. Well, Well, where does all of this touch down with our situation in the 21st century? Where's the the application for us today? Uh, Two questions come to mind. Firstly, who is the rich man in our situation? Remember, the crime wasn't that he was wealthy. His his crime was that he could have done something, but he didn't. Maybe the, the rich man in Jesus' parable represents those who change channel with on the TV when the ad comes on for a disaster relief appeal. Uh, before I was, was married, I, I, I shared a house with a guy who actually objected to me hanging a World Vision calendar in our house. He didn't want to uh, walk out of his bedroom bleary-eyed in the morning and be confronted with the, the awful plight of a sickly, emaciated child on a calendar. Uh, back in those days, they had pictures like that uh, rather than nice ones they have today. Well, actually, God had a wonderful uh, sense of humor because a few years later, that, that person actually ended up as a, a missionary in India. Now, the, the, the rich man in Jesus' parable are like those who object to being challenged on a subject like this. They judge the poor. They uh, apportion blame for their predicament onto the poor themselves. I mean, if the poor are poor, it's probably their own fault. Maybe they were lazy. Maybe they were reckless or made bad choices. So let them sort themselves out. On an international scale, I I think it's pretty safe to assume that we're we're all in the category of the rich man. We're within that ubiquitous 1% of the world's wealthy people compared to the poverty of the two-thirds world. We're actually filthy rich in a country like ours. So that, that raises the second question then, who are the poor? I mean, most people think of poverty in economic terms as if it's the, abs- yeah, the absence of poverty is wealth. I, I guess that there might be some truth to that, but, but poverty is more than just not having money. Poverty is about powerlessness. It's about an inability to be able to change one's own circumstances or to stand up to people who wield power. Wherever poverty exists, there's almost always a handful of people who exert dominance and power, and one of the ways they like to maintain their power is to keep the poor impoverished. So uh, who are the poor in our world? Maybe the poor man Lazarus is... Not someone in our neighborhood, but someone on the other side of the world. There might have been a time when we didn't know about their plights, but the wonders of modern communication today have, well, we've reduced the world to a global village. Geography is no longer a barrier. We we can't hide behind ignorance anymore because we know they exist. And because we know they are there, We have no excuse for doing nothing. But but what if the poor person is in our neighborhood? I mean, in light of a global pandemic like we're going through at the moment, what if the poor person is someone who is is suffering or or sheltering from the effects of COVID-19 virus? Uh, Some in self-isolation 
uh, may, well, they may have family and social networks that help them cope with that. But for others, this will be a deeply distressing time. Might this actually turn out to be the Christian church's finest hour? Well, one of my, my favorite authors on the earliest period of church history is the sociologist Rodney Stark. And in his, his book, The Rise of Christianity, he describes the growth uh, of the church during its first 300 years. From 120 believers in a Jerusalem upper room at the beginning of the day of Pentecost to an estimated 33 million followers of Christ by the middle of the 4th century, over half of the Roman Empire. Now, by, by anyone's count, that, that's, a, that's quite a growth in numbers, right? But, but interestingly, Stark suggests the year-by-year -year growth rate of, of Christians was probably a lot less dramatic than we might first think, possibly even as low as 3 to 4% per year or 30 to 40% per decade. So he asked the question, how did that happen? What, what do Christians do? And, and, and Stark suggests that it had something to do with how Christians loved people and served people in need. And, and in particular, the material needs of those who were poor and powerless. Uh, Christian communities became known as places where you could go for help when the circumstances left you desperate. People cared for you and served you. For instance, uh, church historians point to how Christians took huge risks in caring for sick people. During the 2nd and 3rd centuries, there uh, were uh, massive plagues or, or epidemics that swept through the Roman Empire. People died by the hundreds of thousands. In fact, some estimate that as many as 10 to 15 percent of the entire Roman Empire died in these two major plagues in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. Now, remember, this is several hundred years before the age of antibiotics and, and, and medicines and understanding about disease spreading through unhygienic contact. Well, well, the wealthier people in the Roman Empire had a really interesting way of responding to such plagues or, or epidemics. They, they simply abandoned sick people. The bodies of those who died were typically thrown out onto the street to rot and decay. Wealthy people abandoned the sick and their families fled to the country to avoid contracting their diseases. I mean, imagine what that might have been like. One day you start to feel unwell. The next day you notice a few sores breaking out on your skin. And the, the next morning you come down for breakfast, your entire family left overnight. They've just abandoned you at home to die. Well, I, I, according to, to historians... It was Christians who stayed behind and cared for them. The, the teaching of love and compassion that Christians lived by meant that they, they served their communities by collecting and burying the dead. Uh, to be sure, some probably caught diseases themselves and died. But in the process, there were also many sick people who got healed as Christians prayed for them. In fact, on the whole, the clean living lifestyles of the Christians also meant they actually had a, a greater resilience to disease and were observably less likely to become ill. Back in those days in the ancient Roman world, uh, things like infanticide and uh, unsafe abortions were, were quite commonplace. If your wife gave birth to a girl and you really wanted a son, you, you actually could leave your baby out in the gutter to die. Well, there are stories of Christian communities that took these little ones and raised them. The practice of infanticide amongst baby girls over the years actually led to a uh, disproportion in the gender balance throughout the Roman Empire. There were far more women, uh, far more men, should I say, than there were women. Uh, by contrast, amongst the Christian communities, the reverse was true. Or at least there were plenty of young marriageable women. Uh, Christian families tended to uh, marry off their daughters at a, an older age than their pagan counterparts. 
that they also treated their women well and educated them. And as a result, Christian women were highly sought after as brides. However, for would-be husbands to have access to these potential Christian brides, they first had to go through Christian indoctrination classes, a bit like the Alpha Course, I guess, and become Christians. <laughs> There's an interesting strategy for evangelism we might want to explore again. But, but as the years went by, the unofficial reputation of Christians began to be associated with caring and serving. The moral code by which Christians lived meant they looked and, and, and lived health and healthier lifestyles than other people in society. Women and girls were treated with dignity within their communities rather than as chattels of men. Men and women from Christian families were also less sexually promiscuous than their pagan counterparts, which meant that they didn't contract sexually transmitted diseases that rendered them infertile. And as a result, Christian families were larger, more secure. Christians showed mercy and respect and honor towards their employers, their employees. They, they treated people of different ethnicity with love and dignity. And little by little, the tide began to turn. Because when someone you love is in need and someone else offers to serve you sacrificially, you end up listening to what they have to say. Love and the display of servanthood, well, it has a way of getting the attention of the most hardened critic. You know, the last of the uh, pagan Roman emperors was Flavius Claudius Julianus, often referred to as Julian the Apostate. And he reigned as uh, emperor for only two years, A.D. 361 to 363. And he, he attempted to turn Rome back from Christianity as the favored religion to the ancient pagan religions of Rome and, and Greece. However, he was uh, singularly unsuccessful. And he once grudgingly commented to a pagan friend of his, he said, the godless Galileans, referring to Christians, feed not only their poor, but ours also. Those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. What a, an amazing testament to the caring of the church. So could the era in which we're living proved to be a similar opportunity as Christ followers faced in the second and third centuries. I mean, what might happen, think about it, if we did something similar in our love and care for those around us who are in need? In, in closing, can I remind us that it was Jesus who said, much is required from those to whom much is given, for their responsibility is greater. That, my friends, is us. Let's pray together. Lord, in this time of uncertainty, of confusion, we ask that you come that you give us a sense of peace and a sense of clarity, that you are with us, that you are walking this journey with us. And Lord, as we reflect on one of these church, our church's values at looking at the poor, this seems like the most opportune moment for us to focus on the poor and on the vulnerable. Lord, we ask that you inspire us with divine creativity on how we can cater, how we can meet the needs, and how we can show love to the less fortunate. Lord, I ask that you go with us, that you be with us, that you show us the ways to show love to everyone that we meet. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, hi, HCBC. Uh, we're not able to meet together on a Sunday, but we're still a church family and mm. Each week we want to have a little bit of a chat about things that are still happening in the life of our church. So, John, COVID-19, 
<laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> uh, church life in a, in a COVID-19 world. Well, we've been doing a lot of thinking about this over the last week and actually trying to get ahead of some of this. So one of the things we've been thinking about is changing the format of the way we do church. In many ways, uh, you know, reminiscent of a, of a first century church. We're going to go into a home church situation. So we've been looking at, and last week we asked people to self-identify if they would uh, be happy to use their home as a place where a small group of people could gather, they could congregate, they could have a time of worship together as the church has done over centuries. So we're talking something that's voluntary, and you don't have oh, to go? That's, absolutely. And in fact, if people are feeling unwell, hmm. uh, then the advice, obviously, is don't go out. Uh, if mm. you have a, even a bit of a sniffle or something like that, you may not have uh, COVID-19, but just uh, just don't mm. take any chances there. Mm. But for those that would like to gather, yeah, how, yeah. how big a gathering are we talking about? Well, we're talking somewhere around 10 to 12, 12 maximum, I think, at this stage. But here's the point. We're just taking advice all the time. And the world changes in terms of that advice almost daily. Right. So at this stage, we're thinking of small groups of around 6 to 10 to 12 people. Um, they will meet together on, on a weekly basis. Now, we'll, we'll support that church service. It'll be a proper church service with some uh, materials from here. We'll still be operating at the church here at Charlemont Street. Uh, the staff will be here and we'll be producing resources to go out to those meetings. While we can. While we can, again. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know if you know, but I, I've actually recorded my sermon for Sunday already. So, uh, if, if you happen to see me out fish, oh no, sorry, <laughs> inside thoughts, outside words. Um, but, but we're going to provide for these gatherings, or if people want to access it mm. uh, on their own at home, mm. uh, a normal teaching time, uh, the next in our series that we're working through, mm. uh, through our values at the moment, mm. and uh, plus this kind of yeah. Communication as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the things I think that's important over this next period of time, where it's a pretty unsure time that we're coming into, but there's a lot of value in being connected. There's still a lot of value of being part of a church where uh, you can share your needs, share your pastoral care needs, and you can be cared for in a small group and then. Uh, information can flow back to me here or to the whole to the staff and we can still deal with pastoral care needs as they come up over right. time. So it's not a case you're going on holiday. No. Um, we're just going to do pastoral caring of our, mm. our church family mm. in, in other ways, probably a lot by telephone. Mm. Um, yes. And, but if you happen to, to hear of people uh, who are becoming unwell, would you please let us know? Don't assume mm. that we necessarily mm. will. These are strange days that we're in, and uh, we'll, we'll be communicating as fulsomely as possible. Mm. Uh, do watch the hcbc.nz website, uh, because mm. there may be updates on there. But uh, for all those that have given us their contact details, we'll certainly be uh, emailing mm. often to keep you abreast of things. We may not be meeting together, but we are still one church community under God's hand, and uh, He will see us through this difficult phase. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sure.